Good evening. Thank you for uh, joining us. Sorry for the slight delay. We are also webcasting this, so we had to make sure all of our tech was in place. So um, welcome to everyone who's here and everyone who's watching online. I'm uh, Judy Gradwall, President and CEO here at the San Diego Natural History Museum, and I want to thank you all for joining us tonight, um, whether you're here or, or on Zoom. And we're thrilled to take this opportunity to celebrate the publication of this important new book. Uh, and here it is: a guide to the flora of the Sierra, uh, the flora of the Sierra de San Pedro Martir. The book represents California, and it's absolutely beautiful, and uh, represents the important achievement of documenting the biodiversity in Baja California. And so, be sure to get your copy tonight, and uh, the bookstore will be ready to to sell them following the talk and our authors have said so they'll stay and autograph them for you. So before we begin, I just have a few um, housekeeping reminders. The emergency exits are both behind you and behind me in the theater. And we do ask that you silence your cell phones, but we encourage you to continue tonight's conversation on social media using hashtag Nat Talk. As an organization, Preser focused on preserving biodiversity in this region, it is important that the museum recognize and pay our respects to the indigenous peoples who are traditional stewards of our land. And we recognize the Kumeyaay people whose ancestral homelands the museum currently occupies. We extend our respect and gratitude to the indigenous peoples who lived on and cared for this land since time immemorial. As the original caretakers and conservationists that crossed the border, as well, uh, we honor their continued legacy of understanding, caretaking, and upholding the pillars of biodiversity. We're very happy to have you here tonight, and I just have to talk a little bit about a couple of upcoming programs as well. Um, our next Nat Talk continues the conversation on the Sierra San Pedro Martir. Uh, because we're going to be hearing from Catalina Porras, who coordinates the California Condor Program for, for the National Park, the Sierra San Pedro Martir National Park. She's going to be joining us via, via Zoom from Ensenada, and this is an unusual opportunity to have contact with her. They spend most of their time living up in the park itself and don't have a lot of contact with the outside world unless they're out, out of the park. So this is a rare opportunity to have a conversation and hear about this incredible project uh, preserving the condors. And then also in October uh, is the return of our, of our adultology program, which is for 21 and over, people 21 and over, and it will be actually on October 21st. And uh, it'll, there'll be um, food, drinks, craft drinks, craft craft, uh, food, and um, actual crafts, music. Our scientists are always out, and because it's close to Halloween, it'll be sort of a, a spooky, um, creepy um, pieces of our collections, and it's always fun. Uh, the roof will be open, and uh, tickets are available on our website. So on to tonight's talk. The 22-23 season of Nat Talks is made possible by presenting sponsor, the Downing Family Foundation and our media partner, KPBS Public Media Station serving San Diego and Imperial County. With that, I is my honor to introduce tonight's speakers, the authors of A Guide to the Flora of Sierra San Pedro Martir. First up, we have Dr. Alan Harper, and you guys can go Start taking your seats, I think, if you can see your way over there. Um, are there steps? Okay. Alan is a scientist, photographer, and founding member of Terra Peninsular. And I know we have a number of people. Let's see a hand, show of hands, everyone who's here from Terra tonight. We've got, a, we've got a number of people. They are fantastic partners of ours working in, in Baja California. Um, it's a Mexican nonprofit committed to protecting Baja California's wildlife and ecosystems since 2001. And Alan is also responsible for the beautiful photographs in this book. Our second speaker is the museum's own Dr. John Rebman. John has been our Mary and Dallas Clark Chair and Curator of Botany since 1996. 
He's a plant taxonomist and conducts extensive floristic research in Baja California and in San Diego and Imperial counties. And beginning in October, uh, John is also going to be stepping up to serve as our interim vice president for science and conservation. So I don't think it'll be all botany all the time, but uh, we are thrilled that he is that he is going to be helping us with this. Lastly, we'll hear from Dr. Sula Vanderplank. Uh, Sula is an expert in vegetation of Northwest Mexico and a favorite collaborator of the Nat's Own Botany Department. Currently, she serves as Director of Terrestrial Ecosystem Conservation at Pronatura Noroeste, a branch of Mexico's oldest and largest conservation nonprofit, the Pronatura National System. So please enjoy tonight's talk and remember to head up to the store afterwards to meet the authors. Thank you. Not working now. There we are. Great. Good. I always wing my talks, but I'm not going to this time. So we'll see what we'll see how this goes. Um, thank you for thank you for having me. Um, I've just been such a fan of the museum for so many so many years, and I live up north, very geographically inappropriate. And um, I've come down to a number of of talks here, and it's just it's just a thrill to be part of this this this. Uh, the series of programs here. Um, our project started with a seminar given in 2010 at UC Botanical Garden in Berkeley by Bruce Kirchhoff of University of North Carolina on new ideas for presenting a field guide. One of Bruce's ideas was to photograph on a black background. I thought about doing it on white for a number of technical reasons. As you can see here, if you photograph on a black background, you really can't get rid of the black, even if you isolate the image in Photoshop. But for even more than technical reasons, I wanted my photographs to be cool, like this ad for the iPhone. There is a standard photographic technique called seamless white, fondo blanco in, in Spanish, where you photograph a subject against a white background and then isolate the subject. This is approximately what Apple did in the last photo. So it isn't a new idea, but I had to figure out some of this myself. But what you want to do is to photograph the subject properly exposed, but have the background bright enough that it turns white. And then it is an easy step in Photoshop to select all the white pixels and make them transparent. As you can see here, all the colors, especially the black to white cells at the top, are properly exposed, but the background is pure white. <clears throat> I started experimenting with photo techniques in 2011 at my home. This is a portable studio I set up in a basement room at my house. And I just took plants from our garden, a ginkgo leaf, a flower. John, what is this? Uh, <laughs> it's a big ass flower, I know. Uh, a, a variegated shrub and an iris. It might not be, well, hello. Did it go away? Good. It, it might not be clear, but in fact, this isn't a very good photo. It is much too dark and most of it is out of focus or just fuzzy and the cut stem looks pretty ugly, but I was making some progress in thinking about how to produce a field guide. Okay. In 2010, Bob Thorne, Reed Moran and Rich Minnick published Vascular Plants of the High Sierra San Pedro Martir, Baja, California. When I read this paper, I realized that this would give me the basis for doing, actually doing a field guide, since I am not a good field botanist. And I started talking to Sula Vanderplank about this project. This is an herbarium sheet from the museum's herbarium. If it isn't clear, this is one plant, Aristolochia socorensis, that has been dried and glued onto a sheet of acid-free paper. It was collected in March 1957 by Reed Moran on Isla Socorro in the Islas Ribia Quiqueto. Herbarium sheets are really the gold standard for identification of a plant. Usually you will have leaves, flowers, stems, roots, and fruit. You can compare to be sure of your identification. John has now put photographs on the museum's website of every plant known from the Baja Peninsula and surrounding islands. 
However, the problems with using this are that it has lost all the color of the living specimen. It is really hard to figure out things in this image. And most especially in, in most of Baja California, if you don't have access to the internet, you can't get to the museum's website to see the herbarium sheet. So the idea we had with this book was to photograph living plants to make a virtual herbarium sheet that you could take with you into the field. In July and August of 2011, Sula and I went to the Sierra for our first field trips for this book. This is my portable studio set up at the entrance to the park. And here we are at the roadside near the observatory in the Sierra San Pedro Mark here. This is how you hold the plants. And this is a photo from our first year. And here it's been edited in Photoshop and it's crap. It's really awful. Uh, <clears throat> But, um, and unfortunately, a few of those photos actually found their way into the book because we never saw the plants again in the, in the remaining eight years that we worked on this project. But by the second year, I think I figured out pretty much how to do this. Uh, the answer was to use better lenses. So we had this project underway. And of course, occasionally we found things that weren't plants. And then in 2016, John and his colleagues published a plant checklist for the peninsula. And this gave us a stable system for naming the plants. But it really wasn't as easy as that sounds. Sometimes the plants didn't quite fit into the field studio. Sometimes our clamps weren't strong enough to support the specimen. And sometimes there were shadows where the background was supposed to be pure white. But with time, there we are. But with time, patience, and Adobe software, I was able to create images that did look like virtual herbarium sheets. Here we have a fern, and this is the photo after editing. Um, the circles show where I've cut the image in Photoshop, and I always leave a little gradation there so you can see where it was cut. This is Xanthisma wigginsii an endemic species in the Asteraceae family. The draw image is on the left and the, um, uh, and the edited image is on the right and here. When I got most of the images together for this book, I showed them to the boss and he looked through them. He said, this is pretty nice, Alan. I think we've got a nice project going, but those pictures of Xanthisma wigginsii, they aren't. Xanthisma wickensi. I don't know what they are, but they're something else. And I said, John, you said it was Xanthisma when we collected it. He said, well, I don't think so now. <clears throat> but the great thing is, is that every plant we photographed, we collected. So we could go to the herbarium and find that exact plant and look at it. After about 10 minutes of looking at it very carefully, John declared, yes, it is Xanthisma, but a very strange specimen. I asked him if we could still use it since we didn't find another specimen of the species in the eight years of working on the book and John agreed. So I just wanna emphasize how important it is that we have specimens for every plant in this book, the plant that we photographed, so we can use them to figure out any questions that might turn up later. This is the endemic Dudleya or live forever from the Sierra. And we were able to use it on the title page of the book. We ended up doing 27 page, days of photography and I took 10,200 photos. I estimate, well, it's well over 2,000, it's probably closer to 4,000 or more hours of editing these photos. We used 1,600 photos in the book, but I ended up editing over about 2,000. Some were really easy to edit, but some had real problems and they could take hours of work. And the problem is you can't go back to do it over again. I used some programming skills to put together a number of nice scripts in Photoshop that made it easier to finish this project. And I've got a multi terabyte uh, external drive that all these photos reside on. I've uploaded all of the photos from the book to the Internet Archive, archive.org, where they will be permanently stored. If you want to find them, you just go to archive.org and put in the book's ISBN number. And you get this. There are 10 pages of, um, of images, about 150, 200 pages, 200 images per page, and one page of text. So all of the text 
of the book is there too. Um, so you can just download the PDF. There's no PDF of the book itself, but you can get the images and the text. We also published a paper on our new discoveries documenting 12 new species that we found in the Southern Sierra. And I say we with, uh, uh, it's really true, John, John and Sula did this paper. They just put my name on it. And we've uploaded a checklist to the Sierra, which you can find on the museum's website for the next, your next trip up there. Of course, John, being John, has added one or two more species to the Sierra since we finished this project. This is the title page with our co-authors. Gonzalo de Leon, who is here, um, was the park director at the time and wrote a lovely introduction to the park. He is now a professor at the Autonomous University of Baja, California. Hugh Safford is a professor at UC Davis and gave us a fascinating introduction to the role of fire in shaping the vegetation of the Sierra. And of course, Jose Delgadillo, also at the Autonomous University of Baja, California, is the world's expert on the plants and vegetation of the Sierra. The book is dedicated to my wife, Dr. Carol Baird, who's been a longtime conservationist, actually on both sides of the border. The icons were drawn by Fred Roberts, who is a botanist in Southern California and a fantastic illustrator of plants, birds, constellations, and everything natural. These icons show the growth form of the plants. And then the blue ones are the habitats. Um, and we also have icons for the endemism and, and legal protection, which I'm not showing you here. I made some detailed maps of the Sierra. This is the context map. And then this shows all of the trails um, and roads in the map. The uh, Sierra are basically roadless. And so you can only get there on foot or on horseback. Um, and it may not be easy to see in this, in this image, but there's a white line, it's the 1800 meter line. And the book that we have is the flora of the plants that occur above that line. Of course, most of them also occur below that line, but we're basing it upon the plants that are in the, the high Sierra. Um, sorry, it's not advancing. Try the, there we are. Um, this is a list of all the endemic plants in the Sierra. It's amazing how many endemic plants there are. And this is one of the reasons we did the book because these plants are basically not illustrated any, anywhere else because they don't occur anywhere else. And so trying to figure out the names of the endemic plants up there is, um, is really, really difficult. SSPM is of course endemic to the Sierra. BCA is endemic to the, uh, uh, the state of Baja California. Um, there was actually, there was one more, anyways, there you go, there are three, there are three pages of that. This is a photo of the northern entrance to the Sierra. On the left, it was taken over 100 years ago. The right is the modern one. It's a site called Piñon or Rancho de las, Rancho las Tinajas, and it's where the Nelson and Goldman expedition entered the Sierra. This is a photo from the Nelson and Goldman uh, expedition. Uh, they spent over a year in the peninsula crossing it. And this is the same, the same place taken in 2018 after quite a bit of searching, I was able to find it. And if you look at this, you can see that the vegetation is really basically unchanged. There might be a few more trees in the modern picture, but that's probably just because there, the fire hasn't come through quite as recently. But it's, it's really extraordinarily similar. And that's because this place is untouched and the fire cycle is still going naturally here. So um, the vegetation is a product of the climate, the fire cycle mostly. And um, it is, it's, it's intact for over a hundred years. Um, I suspect if you were to come back in another hundred years, you would find much more serious changes as global climate change takes, takes place. This is a photo by our, our co-author Hugh Safford showing how the open forest is at the top, of, how open the forest is at the top of the Sierra. This again reflects the fre frequent and smaller fires in Baja, California, which make for a healthy forest. So let's look at some of the images. 
This is an alga. We found it in one of the ponds. We, did, we thought it was a vascular plant. And so since we made that mistake, we thought we should uh, help uh, the uh, uh, other people who go up there recognize this. These are the ferns. Um, here you can see the icons um, at the left. The, the green one shows that it's a, a, a perennial and the blue one shows that it lives in the forest. These are the gymnosperms, uh, the pines, firs, cypresses, and related trees. This is uh, the endemic uh, Sierra San Pedro Martyr cypress. Um, and again, you can see it's a, it's a tree, it's the green icon. It, it's in the forest, it's protected under the Mexican endangered species list, and it's endemic to just the park, uh, the, the, high, uh, the high altitude of the park. Um, it's, we have the scientific name here, Hespero cypress, Montana, and the more commonly, the older name, Cupressus, Montana. Um, and now we're jumping slides. Um, these are the angiosperms, um, which is, makes up the majority of the flora. This is a local endemic, Moran zagavi. And you can see from the icons, it's a succulent, grows in the chaparral, and is endemic to the park. Um, this is uh, stenotis, which is a very rare species. Um, I didn't get to see it because I was down taking photos while John climbed up to the highest peaks to find this. Again, from the icons, you can see it's endemic to the park, grows among rocks, and it's a perennial. Uh, and John discovered a new uh, population. I think there were three or four populations known of this plant, and he discovered a new one when we were on this trip. This is folisma, or sand food. And you probably all know it from the desert in, uh, in San Diego. Um, but in Baja, California, it grows in the tops of the mountains too. Um, it's a root parasite. It lives off of the sap of other plants. It has no chlorophyll. And as you can see from the icons, it, it's riparian areas and it's a parasite. This is a favorite. This is the only cactus we find up there, the Sierra San Pedro Martyr Hedgehog Cactus. And this is our Dudley again. Um, the few flowered live forever. Um, this is endemic to the peninsula, uh, lives among rocks, and is a succulent. And you can see from the red flowers, it's, it's pollinated by uh, hummingbirds. This is a clover, which John is going to talk about, so I won't say anything more. Uh, this is a member of the iris family, blue-eyed grass, which is very common in, in Alta California. One of our calicortises, or mariposa lilies, this is wild flax. It's the same genus as the plant we used to make cloth. And this plant too can be spun into thread and woven into cloth. When the first explorers got to the Sierra, the plant was abundant. And in the first trip ever to the Sierra, a large amount was brought down in order to see if it could be made into cloth. We don't know what happened to the harvested plants, but now this plant is quite rare in the Sierra, probably because the cows eat it before it can flower. This is the scarlet bugler quite common both uh, in Baja and, uh, and in Alta California. This is our only endemic grass. And you can see I tried very hard to photograph all the different parts so you could recognize it. California rose with this just lovely, tenuous uh, see-through petals. And this is finally, we have my, I think this is my favorite plant. Um, it's Ivesia or Moran silver hair. It's in the rose family and has just about the cutest, fuzziest leaves you can imagine. I use this for the colophon for the book, which is where you describe how the book was produced. And finally, I want to point out the index of the book. As you see, the pages with the plant photos are really very spare with no common names and only a few synonyms. But in the index, we put every species with all the common names that we know of in English and Spanish, indexed by both scientific and common names. So if you want to know the common names for say, Adenostoma fasciculatum, you can see all the names that are used in both English and Spanish for this common shrub. San Diego chamise, Southern chamise, Southern greasewood, chamiso, chamiso negro, et cetera, et cetera. And it shows also the photo with a page with the photo. Um, if you go to a common name, a mole, that takes you to Nolina palmeri. The 284 is where the photo is. But if you then scan to Nolina palmeri in the index, you get the, all of the common names, uh, one in English, two in Spanish. And then you also see right there an older name, which was uh, 
common uh, back when we started this project, but has since been superseded by John's plant list. If you don't purchase the book tonight, go to sspmflora.com for more information or to order the book, or just email me at allen at allenharper.com. And I want to say thank you. That's me and my wife, Carol, John, Sula, and our good friend, Annie Peralta, who joined us on a number of these trips. Thank you very much. Okay, it's my turn. I'm going to talk about the flora of the area and try to get you excited a little bit because it's really an amazing flora. And as we were talking about, this is a sky island, uh, the highest point in all of Baja California. And there's a lot of really interesting uh, species that occur in this area. So let's start that out. As far as numbers, this is above 1800 meters. So it's about 500 species that occur uh, in the area. There are in 83 plant families, 261 genera. There are 27 endemics to the martyr, making it one of the really important areas of the peninsula as far as endemism is concerned. Uh, another one would be like the Sierra de la Laguna, the low elevation along the northwestern part of Baja, like San Quentin and that region. There are 64 endemic plants to the state of Baja California also occurring there. 15 of those are on are listed for Mexico on the NOM, what's called the Norma Fisial Mexicana. And what's astounding for those of you that actually go to like the mountains here in Southern California is that 94% of the flora is native. That means only 6% is non-native. You go out into like an urban canyon around here, it's almost 30% or more of the flora is non-native. And what's really kind of strange is only 45% of the flora is shared with the Sierra de Juarez to the north. So that means a lot of it is pretty unique in respect to, you would think that most of the high uh, sky island floras would be similar on the peninsula range, but that's not the case in this, this one. So the lower parts of that has a lot of chaparral. You can see what that looks like and where that occurs in Baja California. There's actually a little bit of coastal sage scrub that gets into the lower parts of the martyr as well. Um, most of it is what we call the California mountains ecoregion, and that's the high elevation uh, regions with high elevation chaparral, um, kind of mixed conifer forest. There's some oak woodland there as well, et cetera. The areas are beautiful. I mean, there's a lot of stunning areas if you have not been to the martyr in general. They are, you have a lot of these open meadows, which I think is pretty characteristic of, of the martyr in general. And there's a lot of those that are scattered along the high elevation uh, region. One of the more interesting uh, disjuncts to the area is Aspen. So we think of Aspen like, I think of Alaska or in Colorado. We do not have it in here in Southern California, not in San Diego or the areas, but it does pop to the high elevations of Baja California. And it's beautiful, of course, in fall as it changes color. Now, more specifically, I'm gonna tell you and show you pictures of just some of the endemics. And of course, you can see these in the book. Um, and, but I think we're, I'm gonna go into a little more detail on some of these species. Uh, Alan already mentioned Hesperocypris montana, which is an endem endemic cypress just to the martyr. But what's fascinating is that if you look at this, um, and let me see if I can get my pointer going here, uh, we have a lot of these sky island endemic Hesperocypris species. So of course, here we are with Montana in the martyr, in the Juarez is Reveliana. Here in the Cuyamacas is the Cuyamaca cypress, Stephensonii. For Bestiae is more of a substrate specific thing. This is the Tecate Cypress, and then pops down here to Guadalupe and has their own. So those are all like unique species that are very pocketed into areas. But the one that we have in the region is Montana. Agave Moranii, named after my predecessor, Reed Moran, beautiful uh, solitary rosette forming species at the high elevation. There's an endemic onion. This is Allium urotophyllum, uh, kind of an interesting color for our region. Uh, lots of interesting uh, summer flowering species like Ericamaria martyrensis. Uh, this is Heterotheca brandigii after Townsend Stith brandigii. 
It's a really common species, but restricted to this area in the high elevation martyr. And this is the most recent endemic to the region. So I just described this with Guy Neeson earlier this year. This is Pseudonophalium marcherensi. And I didn't recognize it. We thought it was actually another species, uh, like closer to microcephalum. Um, but it is very, quite different. And that group is a little difficult to identify. And so we didn't realize it until recently that we had an endemic up there. Uh, Senecio marcherensis, also endemic, one of our uh, butterweeds. And then there are a couple of rare species that we could not find when we were actually there. Now, the first one on the left there, I, I actually collected in the 90s, I think, and that's uh, Brichelia subsessilis, but it is very rare there. The other one I've never seen either, and that's Circium trachylomum. And I'm a little worried about that one because nobody has photographed it or seen it lately. So it may be something that's been impacted by the cattle in the region. The high, this is kind of the high Picacho area, and you can see there's a lot of habitat. It's really a lot of sheer cliffs. And as a result, you have a lot of species that are adapted as cushion plants at this high elevation. And some of these cushion plants only occur within a few meters of the highest point. So they're really, really restricted. And of course, they're gonna be probably severely impacted by climate change things. But let me show you some of these cliff dwelling plants. This is, well, it used to be a Sphaeromeria, now it's Artemisia. Um, which is one of the wormwoods, uh, Marcherensis, which is only in a few places at the high ridge. And like I said, these are only along the, the very highest point. Stenotis pulvinatus, Alan mentioned this already. It was only known from six individuals when Reed Moran described it. And we've now since found other populations and actually way down into the southern part. Where, so we're happy that it does occur there, but it occurs in areas that are really hard to access. You have to kind of be on a sheer cliff to find it. Stephanomeria, one of the wreath plants, is a very strange member. It only has a single capitulate head that comes up, and it's called monocephala, one head, basically. And then this is one, I know Mike Simpson's here. He and I described this species, Cryptantha marcherensis, only at the high elevation as well. This is another one we're worried about. It is a bladder pod, Fisaria peninsularis. It was only known from a few of the meadows. The cattle have, se cattle have severely impacted it. I thought it was gone for a while, but then we did find it in the southernmost um, uh, meadow, so it's good to know that it's still there, and I think it's in a few other places. The hedgehog cactus that there is a claret cup, but what's interesting about it is it seems to be a trioecious species, so it has three sexes. We have individuals that are hermaphroditic, individuals that are completely female, and individuals that are completely male. And of course, the cardone does that in some populations as well. So this is like the sec second trioecious species for the peninsula that we're aware of. Um, but it kind of an interesting uh, reproductive biology system that it has. This is Trifolium wigginsii, named after Ira, Wig Ira Wiggins, who uh, wrote the flora of Baja California that came out in 1980. It's a beautiful little ground dwelling species. And this one we found uh, a few years back, Trifolium, well, a fin longipes, it'll probably be a new taxon. It was only found in one little wet area uh, by kind of a little meadow region. It is not described yet as anything, but it is definitely a new record, but I think it'll be a completely new species when somebody works on it. I'm not sure I'm gonna work on it. Uh, the, they're kind of, clovers can be a little bit difficult. Uh, this is a species that Reed Moran described called Hedioma marcherensis. It's a beautiful, really long tube species of Hedioma in the mint family. And this is one of our little uh, um, uh, paintbrushes. It's now put into paintbrush. It was considered its own endemic genus called Ophiocephalus for a while. And uh, this is a hemiparasite. It means it attaches to roots of near nearby plants, but it also uh, is green and photosynthetic. Um, but it really dominates at high elevations in these meadows and is really kind of a strange looking thing. The name Ophiocephalus means snakehead and it kind of gives you that kind of snake looking thing with the tongue coming out of the anthers there. The meadows are really characteristic for this high elevation. That's one of the things that's key. You, you go to the, the Sierra Juarez and they have some open meadows, but they're not as important and kind of characteristic for the mountain range as they are in the Martyr. Uh, a few years back uh, with actually one of Mike's students, Matt Williams, who's at Santa Barbara now, we described this as well. It was a new calyptridium uh, for just the high elevation. Um, Alan already mentioned the Ivesia that's named after Reed Moran as well. 
This one dominates throughout. It's a sinquefoil uh, called Potentilla uh, ludocericea. Really a beautiful species. It flowers almost year round. Gallium wigginsii, of course, once again, after Ira Wiggins. And then let's look at some of the plants that are endemic, not only to the uh, March here, but also to the Juarez, because there are things, if you've never traveled down there at that elevation, you wouldn't get a chance to actually see. Astragalus circumdatus, a tiny little milk vetch or loco weed, really tiny. You can see my fingers there um, that occurs in these open meadows. And then this one's much more common, Astragalus gruinus, and also a endemic to both of these ranges in the region. So they call them loco weeds. Sometimes these things eat, uh, cattle eat them and they go a little crazy and I think sometimes die. <laughs> they can be really poisonous, uh, many of these species. There's an endemic oak that is shared between these. It's called Quercus peninsularis. Um, this little beauty is actually um, all throughout the meadows. It'll flower year round. It kind of gives a pink haze across the entire landscape. That's Hypomopsis effusa. And there's an endemic uh, Ariaganum. And yet working on it, I think uh, uh, Nuri over at San Diego State is still trying to work up this Kenopodium, which may actually turn out to be a new species that's in the meadows as well. There's a Horkelia, if you know, our Laguna skipper is in, uh, basically restricted to Horkelia clevelandii clevelandii. This one is a different variety that occurs in the Juarez and the Martyr. I don't know that there's a, a butterfly that is, feeds only on that. Nolina palmeri, it's a dioecious species. You can see the males on the upper part and the female flowers below. They're actually on different individuals. Um, other high elevation species that you would find there that can be just stunning, like the uh, Frasera or Sportia, deers, uh, ears, a beautiful species in the Gentianaceae there to the left. Uh, various red flowered things, I just threw in different things. They're all in different families, actually, in the mint family, Monardella, the uh, pink family or carnation family, Silene, and the beard tongue group, the penstemons there in the lower right. Um, other cool things up there, I always say Salvia pacophila. This is an endemic variety that occurs in the Juarez and the Martyr. But one that always bothers me, I don't think purple and blue should go together <laughs> that well, but it seems to work for that species. So that's kind of a cool looking flower. And then the southernmost distribution of sugar pine, Pinus lambertiana, is there. And you can see it's one of the really long coned ones. We do have little remnant populations here on Cuyamaca as well, although most of them got wiped out in 2003 during the Cedar Fire. Uh, the lower bottom, lower middle is Penstem californicus, and that is a cross-border rare plant that Sula uh, and myself and, and some of our Mexican colleagues have been working on that is rare on both sides of the border. So it's only occurring at high elevations. We're trying to seed bank and document the populations of that. And pine, the southernmost distribution of the lodgepole pine, Pinus contorta is there. You can see why it's called lodgepole. See how straight this, the trunks are and they're good to be used for, as uh, building construction material. And then just lots of little things. The lower right there shows you Symphoricarpus longiflorus, I say, that that's AFF affinity because very likely somewhere down the road, someone will describe that as a new taxon as well. Just, I guarantee probably genetically it would turn up to be totally different. It just hasn't been described at this point. Now we see some effects of climate change at this elevation in there. So it's, we definitely have some drying that's going on in these higher mountains. And one of the impacts that's very obvious in the Martyr is you see that the mistletoe becomes really prevalent on, especially on um, AB's concolor. And it is actually overtaking and sometimes killing some of the trees. And so I think that is a definite, I mean, plants use water as a defense for things like mistletoes, even though it's a native species of mistletoe, should never be in the abundance that, that we're seeing in this, this area. The same thing is happening in our areas as well. And I wanted to point out, I know, uh, I think Alan or uh, Sula is going to talk about Leptosiphon melingi, but those of you who've been to Melling Ranch, it's named after that family and it's actually very common both in the Juarez and the Martyr. So it's kind of a cute little uh, species with a long history of, uh, of exploration there. At the top, some interesting discoveries and the very highest point on Picacho del Diablo, which I've never been, actually none of us have ever been, harder than heck to get to, a, a major hike to get to it because you have to go way down first, basically camp before you can go up for the day and back down. 
And I think the only botanist that's been up there and spent any time was Reed Moran. It was only a few hours. So it really probably will produce new things that we haven't found yet. But this is Apache plume, Fallujia paradoxa. And just to give you an idea, it is there on the highest point uh, of the martyr. That's the only occurrence in all of Baja California. And then it is completely, the nearest population is way up in the Mojave Desert in the mountains, hundreds of miles from where it should be. So that's a really disjunct species. It's more common uh, in the Mojave Desert, but it was found at this high elevation. And with that, there's a lot yet to explore, and I think we'll find new species in the future in this area. But I'm going to pass it off to, to Asula here. Well, thank you and good evening. So you've heard about the photography behind the book and you've heard about the plants behind the book. And so obviously it falls to me to tell you just a little bit about the people and the adventures and the reality of pulling a book like this together. Um, so that falls to me. You may have skipped over the part where Alan mentioned that we started this book in 2010. I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> we started this book a long time ago. This has been 12 years in the making. And this is a picture from the first expedition I ever did into the sort of remote wilds of the Sierra San Pedro Martí. And this was the trip where I really fell in love um, with that environment. But for, you know, as Alan mentioned, for every plant in the book, there's a specimen behind that. There was a lot of collecting, there was a lot of field work and, and a lot of people that helped along the way. So how did the book come to fruition in reality? Well, it's like a lot of things in life. You start with a goal and you think, okay, that looks reachable. I can, I can climb that mountain. I can climb that tree. And you start <laughs> trying to get to the fruit at the top and you get about halfway up and you say, oh, that's a lot further than I thought it was. And then your friends come along behind you <laughs> and they're like, keep going, keep going. And eventually you get all the way to the top and you collect the fruits and you collect the pine cones and you make your way through. So this is a story of how our friends, I think, pushed us and carried us and kept us going over the 12 years that it took to pull this book together. So Alan mentioned um, that this book began with this paper that came out in 2010. And actually three of my personal heroes wrote this book. And so Bob Thorne was a dear mentor to me when I was at Rancho Santana Botanic Garden. Um, we spent a lot of time together doing flowering lists for the garden. Reed Moran, I never had the fortune to meet, um, but had admired, obviously, his work on the Baja California Peninsula. And Rich Minnick was part of my graduate committee and is, is very dear to me. And so we were very excited when this article came out. And when it was first published in 2010, Alan said to me, Sula, we have to buy a copy and take it to the park. And we were both really excited about this. And I remember the drive and I remember us. <laughs> driving up to the park just full of enthusiasm and sort of all right we've got a flora for the park and don't forget it's the park staff it's the amazing park staff at the national park who steward these plants who protect these plants who conserve this amazing place and they're the true heroes uh, behind the book and behind the story because these are the people protecting these amazing endemic plants But when we got to the park with this freshly printed checklist, someone who shall remain nameless said, thanks, Sula, sure looks like a list of Latin names. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, how are we supposed to know which is which? And how are we supposed to match these up? And what do you want us to do with this? It's, it's in Latin. <laughs> and my little face fell and my little heart fell. And, um, oh, there's my... Am I pointing this the right way? Okay, I'm having some technical trouble. Oh, there. It was this guy <laughs> on my right who said, don't worry, Sula, we'll write a field guide. We can knock this out in a couple of years. <laughs> in 2010. <laughs> so, you know, I was still a graduate student with stars in my eyes, and I believed you, Ellen. <laughs> I believed you that this was only going to take a few field trips, <laughs> a small amount of work. So the first trip that we took really into the wilds um, was with Don, Don Chewy Lawyer from El Rosario. And this was the trip that really inspired me. And 
when Alan came along on this trip, we we had tried early on <laughs> to get that table and that setup and those cameras and all those things up into this area. And it didn't work particularly well. And I don't believe we included any pictures from this early trip, but it was certainly enlightening. And what we had tried to do was follow the Jesuit trails follow the diaries from the from the Jesuits who had passed through the mountains and see if we couldn't retrace their tracks and go to the same watering holes and find that path through the mountains. And so it was a big adventure. And you can see here, everyone's trying really hard to convince me that it's not the greatest idea and there's perhaps better ways to do things. <laughs> but you know, I'm young and I'm stubborn. <laughs> and so we set off and this is when we quickly realized, no, oh, this is why it's tricky. And this is why it's gonna be hard to get that camera set up and that white background and all those tools deep into the heart of the Sierra. Um, this is that first mule trip that we took. We learned a lot on that trip and we learned a lot about the plants um, and a lot of things that aren't in the book, you know, about the uses of the plants and the ethnobotany of the region. And I hope one day we'll be able to write a book on some of the different uses of the plants there. Um, but we've had some amazing guides over the years. And these were certainly the first ones who really inspired me just with their knowledge of the remote regions of the Sierra. So that second trip to the park, we go by car. <laughs> and so Alan gets his table set up and he gets the gear set up and we're all organized and we're there at the park. So one really important thing to notice, there's someone at the front here who is endlessly taking data and working hard too, and that's Carol Baird. And that first trip, she was tirelessly taking notes. She took notes on every time Alan was taking a photo. How many photos did he take during those minutes? Which specimen did I bring to him at that time? And matching the specimens and the specimen numbers to the time that the photos were taken so that we could match it all up when we get home so there would be no confusion about which photos matched which specimens. There's a lot of work behind this that's not obvious at first glance. This is just a, you know, it's a snapshot of one of the field notebooks of all the different collections and Alan showed you this map. Um, but if you look here, this is a huge area. These are remote meadows in different parts of the park. We're really covering an enormous area. And so it takes a lot of organization of data and information. You've seen some of the pages of the book, but behind each of these, you know, getting the name right, getting the identification right, figuring out is this an endangered species? Is this a protected species? What habitat does this species occur in? What life form are we gonna categorize this in? And it might sound obvious, but when we're having those debates, is this a perennial? This is a herbaceous perennial. This is a shrub. No, this is definitely a herb. You know, the, the arguments between botanists go on and on. And so it takes a lot. And then making sure that we've got the pictures, the really close up details of the characteristic things and the things that you're gonna to use to identify these when you go to the park. So I was off in the wildlands, you know, bagging plants, off having a good time by myself. Carol's taking care of us. She's cooking the meals. She's keeping us fed and watered as we're slaving away on this book. But as Alan mentioned, almost none of the pictures from that first trip even made it into the book. I think we photographed over 100 plants on that first trip. And how many made it in, Alan? A handful? As few as possible. <laughs> so I was heartbroken after these weeks in the field. <laughs> and we still were in square one, you know, <laughs> a year into the project. And then came along Sarah Rate, and Sarah played a really important role in this book. I think keeping the field work going, helping with the specimens. She's the reason that we included grasses in this book. She accompanied a lot of these trips. She took my place once or twice when Alan was doing photographs. She played a very important role. And one of our early trips was also with, with Sarah and Ascension here up to the park. Um, so here you can see some of the pictures. This was a horse trip into the park. It was a little less brutal than that original mule trip through the Lower Sierra. And this time we went with guides from Melling Ranch. So we went into those high elevation meadows, um, riding in on horseback with all Alan's equipment strapped across the back of the horses. I wish I had a picture of that. It was <laughs> quite a spectacle. And sure enough, he gets there and he sets up his tent, he starts taking his pictures and the rest of us, you know, get out, set out to work, trying to find different plants and document that flora. So this is Christian Melling from Melling Ranch with Levtosipho Melingi, which John just mentioned. <laughs> you can see here it's in his buttonhole. Hopefully that's, that's clear. There's the Levtosiphon. <laughs> so this is the plant with its uh, namesake, as it were. 
One of our other amazing guides on this trip was Samuel Thingfarlo. And so Samuel is a Kaliwa descendant who was born in the mountains, whose mother was born in the mountains, who came from a small ranch in that high elevation Sierra. And he certainly taught me a lot of things. Um, he taught me how to make flour tortillas. He taught me how to ride bareback in the meadow. <laughs> um, but we've, yeah, we've had some pretty good adventures and some amazing times during this book. And of course, we're sleeping out under the stars and you know, getting to experience the mountains in that very special way. One of the things we also witnessed, of course, was um, conservation concerns over grazing impacts, different problems in the park. And so the, the presence of the cattle in the meadows was sometimes, sometimes made it hard to find those flowers. <laughs> you get there a little late and the flowers are gone. Um, but the, the cows didn't seem to bother, bother Alan. You can see them here in the background. They're just walking right on up. He just keeps taking those photos. Like nothing was going to deter him from this task. You can see there's a variety of habitats. Um, there really was a lot of field work and a lot of different trips into the chaparral and different parts of the park. Um, sometimes we were up at those very high elevation ridges that John mentioned with the endemic plants, often accompanied by the park. You can see here our park guy, uh, Felipe Leon, joining us. National botanists like Victor Steinman uh, joining us from Mature Khan. A lot of people really participated in this project and it's lovely to see a lot of you in the audience here as well today. Thank you for being with us. Some of our other guides um, who really did an amazing job taking care of us getting in, into the Santa Rosa meadows and some of those southern meadows that are more inaccessible like Rolando and Ida here took really great care of us. We also teamed up sometimes with other groups we were on a mammal trip here with Eric Melling. Um, we did some trips, as Alan mentioned, with Annie Peralta and the amphibian teams and reptile teams. And we teamed up as much as we could to get into these different parts of the park. And the whole time, <laughs> no matter what we were doing, Alan was glued to this white screen taking photographs. I can't tell you, from the moment you woke up, he barely even made it to breakfast. He was just taking these photos all day, every day, in every habitat, in every place. There really was a lot of work behind that. We ended our field work with a botany party to push us across the finish line because we needed that help getting to the top of the tree. Um, and a lot of you are here in the audience, but this was our group from the final big push to get the book across the finish line and document the last of the flora. So we're grateful to everyone that was part of the botany party. And it's not a party without the park guards. <laughs> and these are three of the four people who really participated the most in the making of the book, along with Felipe Leon. And I just really would like to especially acknowledge Dr. Gonzalo de Leon, who's also a chapter author in this book. Gonzalo, director, is so encouraging and supportive and helpful. And you really enabled us and made this book possible. And it would not have been possible without you. Would you please stand up for a round of applause? We really could not be more indebted um, to Gonzalo, who was director of the park during the making of this book, um, for all his support. And here is Alan just still, <laughs> still taking his photos. He didn't even make it to the party. We're all drinking margaritas. There was it. Alan still, it was, the sun went down and Alan was still taking pictures. And I just want to end this talk by saying, like, what an honor it's been for me personally to work with these amazing people. So these are our authors. You already know Alan and John. I've just mentioned Gonzalo at the top there. On the bottom, we have Dr. Jose Delgadillo, um, who also contributed a chapter, Dr. Hugh Safford. And then here I have a picture of the new park director, uh, Veronica Mesa, who is carrying this, this charge to take care of these endemic plants into the future. So with that, I'll just show the acknowledgements. I haven't had a chance to show a picture of everyone that took part, but I would like to show you their names. This is everyone that joined us in the field, everyone that made the permits possible, every, our guides, everyone that supported us and helped make this book a reality. Thank you so much. And I, I think with that, we've got a little time for questions. And I don't know if there's questions from the audience or questions online from the Zoom feed. We do have some questions from Zoom, Sula. So from Deborah, are you using DNA analysis as part of your describing a new species or only morphological characteristics? So the question is, are we using DNA evidence as part of the description of new species? I'm gonna give this one to John. 
Um, for most of these, we're actually just using morphology. And that doesn't mean we're not collaborating. Some of those more difficult groups that I talked about earlier that I haven't actually gone into, like trifolium, there is some good morphology there to separate them. But I think it's going to take some phylogeography and looking at DNA to actually figure out where it belongs as far as a variety or a new species, that kind of thing. But a lot of our work on the peninsula still is very alpha taxonomy where we use morphology and can actually tell the difference of things. Jim, I saw you had a question. Microhabitats you're going to look at, rock faces versus metal versus. Obviously, you tried to catch them all. And so, was that just done over time and you've learned new ones as you went up there? Okay, so it's a two part question. I'm going to give the first part to John, which is what percentage of the endemics are endemic to the very highest elevations? And the second part of the question is how did we decide on the microhabitats and how did we separate those out, which I will pass to Alan? That's a good question, Jim. The uh... I would say that there are endemics throughout the entire range from the lowest elevation that we looked at at 1800 meters all the way to the highest. And I tried to mention those really unique ones that are all these cushion plants that I don't know, they are seriously within just a few meters to the highest part of the ridge of any of that area. So they don't occur further down. Some of them are so highly restricted you really do not see them unless you're right at the point of the ridge running across the martyr. So I can't tell you what percentage that is. A lot of them are in the meadows. The meadows house a lot of the endemics, but then some of them are only rocky habitats. So that's why I think the book is helpful to actually, if you're trying to look for them when you go out to the field. So, um, I don't think we actually, the question was, how did we choose habitats and microhabitats? Um, I don't think we actually chose microhabitats. We just chose areas to collect in. And we were really lucky to be able to put together this big expedition to the southern part of the Sierra, which I had not been able to see. Um, and um, and I, nobody had been there for quite a long time. And John and Sula, uh, you saw that paper that they published with, uh, I don't remember, 30, 50 new, new collections. It was, it was enormous because nobody had been there before. Um, and we got, to, we got to trap some mammals there too. So when, whenever we were out there, we were doing everything we possibly could. And as for microhabitats, I just sent these nice people out in the morning and I sat there and photographed and they came back with plants and handed them to me. And I said, what's that? And they said, well, Sometimes they said, we don't really know, but you got to photograph and then we'll figure it out. Um, but uh, mostly uh, we just, when we got to each site, we collected as, as thoroughly as we possibly could. Um, and knowing that the, for instance, the lakes in La Gruya um, and um, uh, uh, what's the East Lan Cantata um, have a lot of interesting things in them. Um, and so, you know, go out in the lakes and discover these things. Um, that, was, that was basically what we did. Do we have another question from Zoom? Yes, we have a couple more. Thank you. Here, this one is from John. Could you discuss burn age mosaic patterns and how do we create these here in San Diego? Question is, can we discuss um, burn mosaic pans? Alan, how about it? <laughs> well, our good co-author Hugh Safford is sitting right here, and he's the world's expert on it. And I'm going to pass the mic. Um, it's a really important thing because that's that's what we're seeing in the Sierra, and um, it's been something that that people on both sides of the board has been working on for. 30, 40 years, there was uh, plans of doing a, 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 a hemisphere park uh, crossing the border. Um, the, the really great thing is, is that um, the forest in the Sierra has been managed with nearly no um, logging. 
And I don't, you, you are probably all young enough to not have to remember when uh, the, the Reagan administration opened up our sequoia groves to logging because the sequoias were protected, but the trees around them didn't need to be protected. Um, we've had a lot of logging on this side of the border that people are not really aware of, and that's contributed a lot to the fire. We've had a lot of fire suppression, and that's one of the reasons we're having such huge fires here. Um, and uh, the Sierra San Pedro Martyr have been uh, have missed most of that because of better fire management practices and much better control of logging. Um, and uh, I, I suggest you go read Hugh Safford's papers and uh, um, uh, what is uh, Steve, Stephen Smith. Stephen Smith, is that the name? Um, Rich Minnick, Rich Minnick, yes, Rich Minnick. There's a whole huge literature on them. Um, and uh, they're, it's, it's absolutely fascinating to see. And, and it's, still, um, it's still much healthier there. But my first trip to this year, I went up with a uh, forest entomologist and he went out in the forest, came back an hour later. He said, I've never been in a forest and I haven't found a bark beetle. And that's because the trees were all healthy and weren't, weren't drought stressed because of the fire. Is there another question from the audience? Yubia. Okay, I'm going to try and repeat that. <laughs> so the question is basically, have we thought about the history of the vegetation assemblages and how these high elevation mountains differ from other sky islands, um, specifically with respect to lineages such as Populus and Hesperus Do you want this one? I think that's one of the things that I do all the time when I'm looking at the species of an area, finding out where its nearest population is and how it got there. Now, I wouldn't always know how it got there by any means, but um, the, it's interesting. The high elevation martyr actually has a lot of affinities to the San Bernardino. And it, it, I think it's a little bit higher than, than anything that we have in San Diego County and San Jacinto and, and the Juarez. So you see a lot of disjuncts between those two. Some of these we cannot explain. I mean, I think Fallujia is one of those, the Apache plume that I can't explain. I have no idea. It it's, doesn't occur at that kind of elevation in the Mojave Desert and how it got there. We have other places it should be um, in the peninsula, but it's not that we found anyway yet. So I can't explain all of those, but they're definitely like any sky island, you have those things that are characteristic of the entire peninsula range. So you see them kind of trickling down every single uh, mountaintop to the bottom. I think some of them have been isolated long enough that like Hesperocypris, where every single top has a has its own endemic species. And I think all of those probably came from the same lineage. But we definitely have those disjuncts that I can't explain. I, I don't know how they got there and come from other places. But I, I think in general, it's a peninsular range run, except for these kind of way far out things for the for the region. Emma, did you have another question from Zoom? Yes, thank you. This will be the last one that we'll do from Zoom. So this one is from Bruce and it's for Alan. Is there a clear description of your photographic methods in the book or in a separate document that you could share for others who might be eager or perhaps foolish enough to try this for other floras? I'll just repeat the question. Um, so the, the question is uh, to Alan, are the methods for the photography in the book or available elsewhere? Um, there isn't a complete description in the book. I'd be happy to. As I, I gave you my email address there, alan at alanharbor.com. Just write me a letter. Um, but there is a discussion group that I learned a lot that's called Seamless White. And I'm trying to remember. I think it's a Google group, but I'm not positive. I haven't been there for a few years. But the uh, technique called seamless white is really um, what's used. And it's a, it's a relatively standard uh, 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 process now, but you just want to, you want to have a 
a seamless white background. It can be a cloth, it could be paper. Um, you want to uh, put light on the background so it's within of it's it, you're you're going you're about your pixels about 254 out of 255. You want it just under bleached out white. And then you want to have more flashes. And those flashes are behind your subjects, illuminating the background. And then you want more flashes on your subjects to give them correct illumination. And then you have to get everything synchronized. And then the batteries fail in the flashes. <laughs> and Canon in its intelligent wisdom only shows you that the batteries have failed because the lights are not on, but you can't see the backs of the flashes when they're set up. And when you take the picture, all the flashes go off, so you can't see which ones have worked and which haven't. Um, it's it's an absolute nightmare. And uh, you spend you, we we would go up with three hundred batteries uh, for for a field trip. I, I think I figured I was going through twenty five to thirty a day. So. Are there any more questions from the audience? I see you have your hand up. Okay, that's a great question. So the question was, how many specimens are we taking per species and for the photos and where were those specimens deposited? I'm, I'm gonna take this one. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we attempted to only take one set of pictures per specimen, um, but occasionally we'd find one in flower and one in fruit. And so each time we did a photo series, we would collect um, specimens associated with that photo series. So if there were multiple, if there were photographs of multiple individuals, there would be multiple specimens. The specimens are deposited firstly at the BC Mex Herbarium in Ensenada, and then duplicate copies are sent to the herbarium here at um, the Natural History Museum, the SD Herbarium here. Um, and I think on the whole, we just did two duplicates for most species in this case. Um, so there can be multiples. And there were occasions where we thought we'd found something new. And then later you're like, no, that's <laughs> another set of pictures of the same species. <laughs> there are some pretty cryptic species up there. But yeah, on the whole, any new photo run, so any new material collected would be associated with a new set of specimens. And, you know, occasionally we'd find one that was better than a previous one. Question at the back? So I'll just repeat the, the question is, has anyone done pollen cores um, in the meadows, uh, the high elevation meadows to look at the, the vegetation history at the high elevations based on the pollen cores? Not to my knowledge, does anybody else have knowledge on this? There, there are some people that do the pollen uh, coring at Huabese and Ensenada, but I'm not aware of them doing it there up in the meadows at that elevation anyway. There, there could be something there I'm just not aware of. I'm curious, Gonzalo, do you know, has anyone ever done pollen work in the park? You were there for 11 years. <laughs> Did anyone study pollen? So apparently there was a study between 2008 and 2012 um, done out of Uabese by a professor working hand in hand with Dr. Jose Delgadillo, who's one of the chapter authors for the book. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think that might be all we have time for. Is that <laughs> one more question? All right, last question. Any more? <laughs> Any more for any more? Okay. Oh, Sula can answer that one. <laughs> so sat near the back of the room is an angel <laughs> in the form of my major professor and advisor, Dr. Ezequiel Gurra, who has a magic touch <laughs> when it comes to international permitting and working with Mexican agencies. And we were extremely fortunate um, during the development of this book that Ezekiel um, worked with us to share his permits for, for collections on the peninsula so that we were able to collect those specimens in Mexico um, legally and in accordance with the guidelines and also with the no objection of the park, to which we're very grateful to Gonzalo. And I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming.